And welcome to another edition of the Big Nick Energy Podcast. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods, and Podbean. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Join our Facebook group. And most importantly, join our chalkboard. It's a messaging board app designed specifically around gambling and sports. Our page is over 70 members now. Once we get to 100, we'll be doing a ticket giveaway to an upcoming Knicks game. I have a very special guest today. I actually idolize this man a little bit. He doesn't know this, but I work for WWE, and I'm forced to see his face twice a day, every day on This Is Awesome. <laughs> so I've already known what he's been doing for years, even outside of points bet or MSG. Kazim, how are you doing today? Oh, man, that's an incredible introduction, bro. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. That uh, Hell of a day. Hell of a couple of games uh, for the next the past few weeks. But uh, oh, yeah. man, I've been following your stuff for a long time, especially like all the Nick content creators out there and uh big fan of your stuff. So uh, it was a, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you, man. Much appreciated. I'm trying to get to MSG points bet whenever, whatever will hire me one day. So if I got follow your footsteps <laughs> one way, Thank you. Um, I do want to ask you, cause you seem like, you seem like a busy guy, clearly, obviously. Um, what goes into a Kazim day from morning to night with all the recording and videos and stuff you have to do from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, including tucking your daughter in, how crazy <laughs> is your day? uh it's pretty crazy sometimes uh none of it gets done without my my lovely wife jasmine who uh does god bless her be lifting when it comes to uh raising our very young daughter and and definitely gives me the time to do all this stuff but as far as a typical day goes i mean if it's a uh, monday tuesday thursday or friday in the morning i'm at uh points bet uh shooting the episodes of count it uh for about maybe like 10 to 12 on Monday and Thursday. Right after that, I'm right back on my laptop recording uh, the Mass Man show for The Ringer. And yep. uh, that's every two Monday and Thursday after Raw and uh, before Raw and after uh, Dynamite. So um, that usually how that goes. Then kind of factor in Knicks games as well. So every Knicks home or away game, I'm doing inside the lines with my guys, Mike Janela and Jeff Eisenband. Uh, so that, that's usually happens. I want to say around like two, three o'clock PM, 4 PM, depending on if the Knicks are in the Eastern standard time zone or Pacific, uh, obviously if it's later, I'll be there a little later. Yep. Then, um, you know, certain nights we'll do a MSG PM with, uh, Monica McNutt sometimes, uh, we haven't done the show in a while, but it'll be coming back soon. But we also do, um, the betcast for MSG network as well, where we kind of, serve as a um uh, alternate stream for certain Knicks games with uh some some betting companies so it's really fun and then like you mentioned earlier uh certain days maybe like once a month I'll drive up to or have be driven up to Stanford Connecticut do some stuff for WWE whether it's filming uh the ultimate show on their Peacock networks before some of the premium live events or filming episodes of this is awesome at the same uh facilities so i try to stay busy as well and of course on wednesdays i shoot record and produce my own podcast say less which has been like a labor of love and uh something i've loved doing ever since the pandemic and kind of really dialed me into my creativity and just kind of knowing that's always my home base so um and it's what my best friends low-key and rosie and uh yeah man it's been a I I i say a typical day if you know last <laughs> yeah like two weeks ago like i had a day where i had to do all of those in one day you know oh my like god there was a day where i had points bet in the morning mass man show in the afternoon uh i got a car up to stanford went to stanford does this is awesome do uh the ultimate show come back to the garden do FanDuel inside the lines and then come home so uh but i love it man like i've worked my ass off for the past 12, 13 years to be afforded these opportunities and being able to, you know, just be in in in, in this media game and be blessed to have the career that I've, I've gotten to have and just see the things I've gotten to see and do the things I've gotten to do. So it seems like a lot of work, but it's just like, what else would you rather be doing? You know what I mean? So it's if you're enjoying your job, you never work a day in your life. And it sounds like you just have a bunch of jobs you enjoy. That's the way I look at it, man. Uh, in addition to some of the front-facing stuff, I get to work with a lot of incredible people behind the scenes as well. Uh, a lot of wrestlers, a lot of artists, uh, a lot of a lot of people. So 
But like I said, man, uh, and you said it, uh, if you're not having fun, you never really feel like you're working. Sure, there's definitely days where you'd rather want to sleep in and just like not go to the gym or not do any of the extra stuff that you kind of need to do to be able to do all these things. But you only get one life, so I don't want to feel like I didn't uh, leave any stone unturned. I love that. And Kaz, like I said, you are an inspiration to me. I hope to do even one third of what you're doing at any point in my life. Very thoughtful, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Uh, To get into the Knicks stuff, you like you mentioned before, the Knicks have had a very wild couple weeks. Uh, Just to mention the last three games, because I want to mention three games, so I include a win. Try to stay a little positive over here. There you go. Okay. Uh, So three games ago, the Knicks beat the Celtics 120-117 on the the road in overtime, which was dope. Uh, Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle actually did their thing a little bit, which, Mm -hmm. I mean, Jalen Brunson keeps doing his thing, but Julius Randle, as we know, is a roller coaster in and of itself. So the two games since then, unfortunately, they've lost back to back to the Nets and the Lakers. Uh, they lost to the Nets for the ninth time in a row with no KD. I'm pretty sure KD didn't even play in four or five of those nine games, even while he was on the team. That was 122-115 in a game. The Nets shot a scorching 55% from three. Their starters were obviously led by Kyrie Irving. Uh, their starters as a whole shot 15 to 29 from deep. So that's not going to do it. And they're a team that ranks second in the league in three-point percentage. It made sense to the naked eye that with the Knicks drop zone coverage and missing Mitch, which means guys have to do even more in the paint, according to Tibbs, that they were going to be burned outside. Um, Kaz, about the Nets game specifically and the way they got burned, how do you what what happened? What did you feel about that? Um, I'll say as far as it's been kind of a, a um, I'll say it's definitely been one of their handicaps for most of the year, right? Like it feels like every game especially for the first two months of the season uh teams were shooting their career high three-point percentages against the new york knicks over and, and over again <laughs> it definitely happened you know there was definitely something to that and i think the knicks are trying to correct that with this upcoming trade deadline right like when you look at the lineup and you look at some of their personnel and what they do very well um outside of their bigs you know what i mean like i think there was some stat where like the knicks were like the fourth and fifth tallest team in the league and it's like yeah that sounds good but most of those guys that make up that height are their centers so when you average them out and put the number out it's going to look like they're tall but they're very they're not they're not very rangy you know what i'm saying like between rj barrett and quentin grimes they're both similar in height and they don't really have that reach or that extension yeah their Um, wingspan is not that long considering their wingspan is not that long Yeah. So and that's the difference in the NBA between an inch or two inches where, you know, you got guys that will shoot the ball from 30, 40 feet out and uh, everybody can shoot now, you know. So it's um, it's unfortunate sometimes. But, you know, as far as like the good has been uh, is concerned when it comes to uh, the way they've been playing, um, I think the absence of Mitchell Robinson, um, they've done the best that they can as far as rebounding the ball, the one thing they can't make up for with Mitchell Robinson is the altering of shots and blocking shots and being able to really extend, especially those baseline threes where a lot of NBA's big men like to shoot from that short corner three. Mitch Robinson is an absolute dynamo when it comes to getting out and contesting those. He might get caught here and there. Obviously, we know his issues with foul troubles or whatever, but that presence has definitely been missed in these last couple of games. And, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of sucks because it balances out uh, great performances from Jalen Brunson, uh, pretty good performances from Julius Randle. Um, that, that Boston Celtics game, that first uh, national TV game of these last three that they played, I think Julius Randle played the best game of the season right there when they went up against Tatum and Brown. And yep. it was the night all-star starters were announced and people were, you know, thinking about who's going to be all-star reserves and, I said, here's the tape, Joe Mazzulla. You know what I mean? Like when you're picking, when they're picking the all-star reserves, that's your tape right there. Julius Randle just stamped it. And I still think he's going to be an all-star reserve. Um, Brunson. Agreed. Yeah. Like in, in addition to that though, uh, Brunson's just been, uh, he's much more scorer than facilitator. You know what I mean? When it comes to this team, but I think he's had to be that because their backcourt scoring um, has been off and on, you know, whether it's RJ Barrett being hurt sometimes and then not being as efficient when he's in, um, whether it's Quentin Grimes, who, you know, gets a lot of open looks and when he's hitting them, you know, that everybody's kind of rolling, but it's not for lack of trying. Like there's been a lot of open looks that the Knicks just haven't been knocking down in the yeah. past few games, but 
we see how they look like when they do knock them down. They can beat anybody in the league. But, you know, it's a cliche as it sounds. It's definitely a make or miss league. And the Knicks kind of proved it with these last two games against the Nets and the Lakers. It's 100% how basketball works. You only win by putting the ball in the hoop. It there doesn't matter how many blocks or rebounds <laughs> or steals you get. If you don't put the ball in the hoop, it does not matter. Yeah. Um. You mentioned the Lakers game a little bit just to paint the picture. Uh, they ended up losing in overtime, 129-123. They were down 114-108 after a LeBron James, 3-141 left. Jalen Brunson scored the last six points of regulation to tie it at 114 before the Knicks fell in overtime. Uh, two storylines that came out of this, Kaz, that I'm sure you've obviously seen uh, through social media and stuff. One, we'll start in re- we'll start in order. So the first thing was that RJ Barrett, um, who did start the game terribly, he started out over five, had two turnovers and uh, had two turnovers in the first quarter, had two fouls, um, not looking good. His second, third, and then part of his fourth quarter, uh, defensively, admittedly, he had mishaps, but he started out over five and ended up five for thirteen, which means he ended up five and eight. And went three for three on layups in the fourth and scored six of eight points in a row. But then he gave up a drive to Russell Westbrook going under an Anthony Davis screen twice, even though he was near the elbow. Westbrook dishes to Troy Brown. It's an open layup. Hardenstein gets there late. It's an and one. He doesn't play the rest of the game or overtime. So he is out for the last 11 minutes. I believe it was 1151 if I wrote it down correctly. So mm. what do you what do you take in that that RJ made it like he seemed like he was coming up a little bit in the fourth quarter? I know he started out slow. He did have the defensive mishaps, and then Tibbs just pulls him the rest of the game. It's IQ and Grimes of the two and the three. Um, I'll say this, man. Uh, RJ is a pro, and for what you people may feel about Tibbs today, I know today is one of the days where if you're anti Tibbs or you criticize him, like this is one of the games that you kind of do it. But he's kind of been true to his word throughout the entire season. If you're not going to play defense, you're just not going to play. Is yep. the reason why a lot, you know, a lot of guys uh, that were in the rotation at the beginning of the year aren't in the rotation now, you know. And um, to Emmanuel Quickly's credit, at the time, Quickly was playing better, you know, like he was one hundred percent. He was he was making plays. He was hitting shots. He was, you know, his his wingspan and his length is a little bit more favorable as far as in the backcourt position. So. At that time, like I couldn't be mad at for for you know for Tibbs going that way because outside of a probably poorly drawn up uh, play in the end of regulation, that was the second of the two storylines. Yeah, Yeah, like they could (laughs) have stole that game. You know, a game that they probably had no reason stealing, especially those last two minutes and that LeBron James three that kind of sucked the energy out of the arena. Yeah, Um, Jalen Brunson did what he does. You know, he's unflappable in crunch time and. You know, with him as your point guard, you know you're always going to get – he's always going to get you a good shot. And what's even more valuable for Jalen Brunson is defensively. You know, like we talk about just how much the Knicks have given up as far as like open threes because of their lack of wingspan. They make up for it a lot with Jalen Brunson willing to give his body up. And, you know, we've seen him take that charge on uh at the end of the game and that's not the first time he's done that it will get his nose there and and make a big defensive play so i think it's it's more kudos to him and i know the rj barrett storyline has been lingering around as far as like who closes these games and it's not it, i knew it was going to be a story because it happened a few times already it happened a few times during the season and nobody really said anything because the knicks won a lot of those games um I forgot who posted the stat on Twitter. I might, it might have been Schwinnie Poo or someone else from the Strickland, but they said RJ's been pulled 16 times in his career in non-garbage time games. In those 16 games, the Knicks are 3-13. and 13. Mm, Wow, that's crazy. I mean, I didn't know that was the number. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, that is that is an incredible number, 3-13 and 13 when he gets pulled. Here's the thing. RJ Barrett, I do believe that his defense is a little bit more glaring this year. Because I think folks kind of thought he was going to be this two-way sort of player, like he was trending to be in his first two years in the NBA. Um, I feel for him because, you know, he's kind of coming in with now another alpha in Jalen Brunson. And he's kind of starting to figure out if he's... You know, a couple of years ago when the Heat were the Heat and everybody just thought like a superstar like Chris Bosh going from Toronto to Miami just had an easy time because you're playing with LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. Like, 
Yeah, when but they made him play third, center, so that wasn't really the case. You didn't have to play center, but like when you're a third player in a team where two guys dominate the ball usage wise, that third player has to be so efficient. Yeah. That third player has to be ha- can't give up defensive lapses, can't miss open shots because those become glaring. And you know, RJ Barrett is very much clearly, and I think rightfully so, the third guy on this team, just because age money being paid everything else as far as the way the way julius and jalen has been playing like maybe like barrett in a great team i think on a great team which i think the knicks can be um that's his fit like of course he has time to evolve into a, a a superstar he's only 21 years old you know what i mean like he still has the opportunity to yeah. play and, and become like a focal point of an offense for a team but right now the way the knicks are currently constituted um, you know, he's got to be the third guy. And I truly believe when you're a dude that's missing those opportunities where you're missing open shots or not being able to play as well on the offensive end, it starts to affect you a little bit defensively. And 100%. I think if you're Tom Thibodeau and you're playing against the Los Angeles Lakers and you're trying your best to get a home win and defend home court, you kind of got to do what you got to do. So the good thing about this is, RJ Barrett has always seemed to be like a pro even before like he got to the NBA. He kind of knows the ebbs and flows. And this isn't the first time he's kind of had to deal with a little bit of adversity as far as being a New York Knicks. So I think with that being said, with the trade deadline sort of looming around, it's going to be a little weird for the next few weeks, right? And I think until we know exactly what this team looks like going forward to the spring and to the playoffs, you're going to see these games of R.J. Barrett and there's going to be chatter about R.J. Barrett about like just where he sort of fits in this team. And last night, obviously, with the world watching, people are going to talk. I think R.J. is, is going to bounce back just fine. And um, But for him to move forward and be one of the top players in the NBA that I know he wants to be, he's got to take that defensive assignment and not be a liability sort of the ends of games. 100%. And even if they're going to give the the best wing or point guard player to Grimes or quickly, if only two of the three of them share the floor, RJ Barrett's still going to be covering someone that's a good ball handler. You don't cover twos or threes in the NBA and they, they can drive on you. It is what it is. Yeah, everybody is a good ball handler now. Right? Yeah. Like when, you're, when you're six foot six, like everybody you're going to guard is either going to be a small guard or a big wing with some handle. You know what I mean? Yep. So like it's, you know, the defensive lapses I truly think has had to do with, you know, some games where he didn't get it going offensively, you know, when he got it going offensively, he's still young, he's still 22. And that happens, man. Like if you don't, you know, how many times have you been in the back, in the backyard or in the park and you hit a good shot and you're the first one back on defense, ready to sprint. Up Almost every time. Everybody does. You Vin's, know? Vin's on mute, but Vin can attest. I'm terrible at shooting and good at all other aspects of the game. My shot goes in. Our team wins. <laughs> It comes and goes. It's on the legs. It's on the legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, man, I feel for RJ, though. He's going to feel some heat definitely for the next couple of days. And the good thing about the NBA is that there's a new game every single day. So he yeah. can the narrative on himself by this time tomorrow if he goes and balls out against Jimmy Butler and then Bam out of bio and those guys. I would love that because I since Jimmy Butler's not on the Knicks, I would I always hated Jimmy Butler. Uh, <laughs> one, more th- one more thing about the Lakers game before we move on. Uh, the last play of regulation, you uh, touched on it a little bit before. 4.5 seconds, Brunson imballs the ball imballs the ball to Randall. Um, it seems like Randall should give the ball back to Brunson. Obviously, we don't know what the play call is or how it's drawn up. Uh, he ends up not doing that, is covered by Davis, gets doubled by LeBron, doesn't get a shot up, the Knicks lose in overtime. If you were to either, one, describe how you think the play should have gone, or two, put onus on someone, I'm assuming it wouldn't be Brunson, obviously. If you get wide open, you don't get the ball past you. It is what it is. But between Randall or Tibbs, do you think it's someone's fault? Do you think it was just a bad read? Like, what do you think happened in that last 4.5? I mean, it's, it's the league, so it's definitely a little bit of everything, right? Like, one, it's a great play from LeBron James. He's still an athletic freak, and he closed. And, you know, when you get closed on the baseline, you use the baseline as an extra defender. Yeah. Anthony Davis is there. LeBron's there. He's willing to take that risk, knowing even if they do close out, and Jalen Brunson gets the ball back. Braun's athletic enough to get back and at least make a good contest. So one, or they run out of time. Or they run out of time, right? So you know he left at just the right moment to make him pick up the ball and not get a shot off. So one, it's a great play from LeBron James. Two, I do think it's a little bit on Tibbs because usually you know when you got less than five seconds on the clock, and I heard you know Tibbs in the post game saying there was like three options there, and I'm like. 
It's five seconds on the clock. Have we watched Julius Randle play basketball? He makes he takes him five seconds to make one decision. What do you mean there's three yeah, options there? Like, <laughs> you know, just I mean, if I'm not a, I'm not no NBA coach, but usually a lot of times you either have uh you know one of your big men um inbounding the ball or one of your best shooters inbounding the ball. And you know, uh Brunson, who's a great shooter, but your best ball handler, you probably want getting open. And if all hell breaks loose, especially if you're drawing up an out of bounds play, get it to your best creator. Get it to the yeah. guy who created six or seven points just now in the past few games, you know, in the past uh, few minutes. Um, I'm not going to be too hard on Julius because it's like you know he he's he's played pretty well this season, and yeah. you know, Jalen Brunson definitely has had opportunities to close these games and have these walk off wins, and so has Julius Randle. And again, you're going to hear it a million times over. Some guys in the league get that shot and other guys in the league just don't, you know, yeah. uh, sometimes like these guys end up in the hall of very good and there's not wrong with being in the hall of very good, but those guys that are great, especially now you make nine figures in your lifetime. That's yeah, awesome. like being in the hall of very good is, is, is extremely nice money if you can get it. Yeah. But those guys that make those, Clutch plays time and time again when, you know, everybody knows the best player is getting the ball. These guys have played you all game long. They know what your tendencies are. There's five seconds left. Even if you draw up the perfect play, it might not go right. Yeah. Sometimes you got to get your ball to somebody who can make something happen and just make something happen. Julius Randle, to his credit, has made things happen a lot of this offseason. Has it been in crunch time? Has it been with the with the game on the line? He's a seven inning starter. He's not a closer. He gets you. Yeah, so far. like I mean, no, no, no knock to him. He's been amazing this season. But like a lot of guys in the NBA aren't those guys, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's really like six of them. If you really think about it, like LeBron, KD, Steph Curry, Kyrie Irving, Dame Lillard, like Tatum. Luka, like <laughs> there's yeah. only a handful of those guys, you know. And the good thing about the Knicks is that. And I think I understand where the pain is coming from from Knicks fans is that like they're in these close games and it's coming down to the last shot. And you know they've played well enough to win these games. And the frustrating part is they can't close a lot of these close games, especially at home. So I understand the frustration from Knicks fans when you know you lose these close games. That's that's the downside of being in the hall of very good. Like you're yeah. good enough to be in these games, but greatness closes these games time and time again and also greatness doesn't get in these in these situations you don't have to get it down yeah to greatness line. wins by 12 sometimes Great, greatness <laughs> is sitting on the bench sometimes like yeah. you know, doing that but the knicks just don't have that. only every team was the pistons <laughs> right exactly you know and i love jalen brunson he, he gives me a lot of lefty chauncey billups vibes when he's out there you know what i'm saying yep. just a guy who doesn't make a lot of mistakes and you trust with the ball in the hand but is he one of those eight or nine guys on the planet that when all hell breaks loose just give him the ball and win the game not yet i mean he hasn't proven it yet he's had opportunities to prove it he's not, he's, he's definitely one of the best clutch players in the league right now but as far as five four three two one win us the game he hasn't had the opportunity to prove it yet. He's right. You know, so it kind of is what it is. And I, like I said, more onus on Tibbs throwing up, drawing up that play and not getting it to Brunson, but all the credit in the world for LeBron James to make that great defensive play. Kaz, it's okay. LeBron's had enough credit in his life. We don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's uh, why he's still doing it. So yeah, hey. Exactly. Um, to get off of the Knicks a little bit, I want to ask you a couple questions about uh, betting and sports gambling, and then I'm going to do a, com a WWE comparison to the Knicks roster at the very end. Um, in <laughs> regards to gambling and working for points bet, what, how long have you been gambling, and what is your gambling sport of choice? Um, I'll tell you this. like I love, I, in the past like year and a half, <clears throat> I've definitely got more into gambling on, on the NBA. Okay. Um, NFL gambling is a little bit too much heartache for me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know enough of the rosters sometimes to make informed decisions, you know, but I feel like I have a much more informed decision making when it comes to NBA basketball, especially finding some diamonds in the roughs, finding some great props from guys that, you know, maybe the league hasn't been looking uh, into yet. Yep. And uh, my co-host Ariel Epstein, that is the prop queen and she kills when it comes to that type of stuff, you know, and, I think the balance that we sort of 
bring off when it comes to doing the show is sort of I'll bring my knowledge that I have of the way the game is played and these players and how it relates to bets or whatever. And Ariel brings her knowledge of just knowing how players move and trends and right. you know, knowing exactly where to find those diamonds in the roughs before the line moves or the rest of the league catches on, on how good this player is and stuff like that. So it's really fun, man. Like I'm, I wouldn't call myself like the biggest gambler yet, but when I do gamble, I, I I'll have so much fun with it because the NBA and just it's every night in nature just gives me so much excitement every time out. Like NFL Sundays, it's like, I like chilling on Sundays. I like relaxing. I hear that. Like yeah. my fantasy football. Like fantasy football is good enough for me. Like for the, all the reasons why I love fantasy football, I can't do fantasy basketball, right? <laughs> like fantasy football. Dude, I, hear, I hear that. Me and Vin have a fantasy basketball league together. It is nauseating to set your so mind up and look every day. It's every day. It's so much. And it's every yeah. single day, right? But with sports gambling, it's the same reason why I like it for basketball and not for football because it's any day you feel like it. Any day, yeah. every day a game is on. But in the NFL, it's either Thursday, Sunday, Monday. Sunday and Monday, I like enjoying my Sundays and Mondays. I throw out my fantasy Those team. Thursday games are crap 99% Thursday of the time. Thursday games are crap. I'm not trying to bet on it, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I, I love it, man. I've definitely grown a, uh I wasn't the biggest sports gambler for the past maybe like first 30 well thankfully before i'm a teenager but up until my 30s i want to say but uh i was like man you got a bookie at 15 that is not good (laughs) (laughs) but uh it's been fun man like i definitely enjoy it and i'll make sure i I do it responsibly as well like i never want to like go and like lose my shirt or anything like that i just like i I love the the feeling of just like knowing better you know what i'm saying and just like 100 being up on it i'm not trying to make get super rich off of like sports gambling i just love the the sport of knowing knowledge and trends and how the game is uh transcending agreed 100 percent um to follow that up what is are you a parlay guy or you usually just do like one or two at a time kind of thing i hate parlays man i can't do it <laughs> like, okay I'm so i'm gonna ask you a follow-up there the answer might be none what is the largest odd bet or parlay that you've ever hit <laughs> oh my god i know i've never hit any <laughs> I've never had any like I've so here's the thing, right? So um my, shout out to my guy Mike Janella, right? Uh we do a thing called a dollar hollow on MSG uh, yep. right before the show. And I think the second dollar hollow of the season he hit. And basically dollar hollow is like, yo, listen, we're gonna take a dollar or I'm gonna make like the most wild like, stuff. But, yeah, like what's the biggest jackpot we can get off like a one dollar bet or something like that? And he nails it like the second game. So I'm just like Oh, it can't be that hard, right? And yeah. then so I get into it. And then, like, maybe I'll get, like, a nice three-leg or something. Like, maybe it's, uh, you know, the Knicks are playing against, like, a rivalry team. Maybe someone's out on defense. Okay, this seems like a pretty good Brunson-Randall game. Yeah. Uh, there, You know, I think I, I got some really good same games the, de- the days that Emmanuel quickly was starting – because he was getting like over five and a half rebounds like every single game. Like and they had his assists at like 3.5, he would be getting seven. Right, exactly. Yeah. He was killing for me. But before then, like I'd never hit on any like, <laughs> parlays. Like I would always like miss a point, miss a rebound. Like, and then it just becomes unfun for me and I can't enjoy it. I love a good, you know, points prop, a good rebound prop here and there, finding a diamond in the rough. Uh, finding a good upset, you know what I mean? Especially in college hoops, you know, college hoops are so unpredictable. Uh, so it's always fun to get in there and find some action as well. Uh, but definitely in the NBA, I have more fun uh, finding players, getting attached to those guys and find and, and seeing how much I can get on a run with them. Another guy I've loved uh, this year is, uh, um, I want to say, uh, Keldon Johnson from the San Antonio yeah. Spurs, right? Like, if you're a great yeah, stats, uh, bad team guy, you always hit your stats. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like good, good guy, bad team. Those are my favorite dudes to find. Oh, yeah. So they got like the neon light. He ain't passing it to nobody. If uh somebody else happens to get it going and you get a nice point rebound assist or something like that, they're playing another bad team, and all of a sudden you look up and you see it's like Rocket Spurs 140, 136. Oh, like, I was just thinking that, yeah. <laughs> that's my type of game, you know. Over, I mean? over, oh. over, over. Yeah, oh man. I, I, it's, I, if you follow me on points, I watch the show. Like I rarely bet the under. It's not yeah. fun. It's not you know? fun. 
who the, like who like what? It's like going to like the it's like going to 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 Morton's and not getting the steak, right? I'm like, not gonna lie to you, man. I'm an I love unders. I mean, I know I'm one of the few. Good for you. Okay, <laughs> I'll take unders all day when it comes to Kyle Hoops and all that type of stuff because Kyle Hoops is not predictable. Uh, but like it's just no fun for me, man. Like I like the drama of getting numbers there, and you know I don't want to I don't want to wait until the very last minute and get like a terrible bad beat like we saw with like Washington State. Yeah. The other day. <laughs> and then like if it's like the under there, you're or just... like the eighteen fouls when you're down nine, like you're oh, not gonna get there. God, the worst. You know what I'm saying? And it just takes all the fun out of doing it. So if I'm gonna bet, if I'm gonna get on some games. More than likely, unless there's like a terrible injury or just something where you just assume it's two good teams, it's going to be tight, it's yeah. national TV, it's not going to be a big game, you know what I'm saying? Then, then I'll take an under here and there. But if I, if it's a random Tuesday night on league pass, I'm like, yeah, smash that over. That's what I usually go for. Okay, see, Houston, you're hitting 280. Oh, 1,000%. <laughs> easily. <laughs> um, just to let you know, because I actually have hit one crazy parlay in my life. Unfortunately, uh-huh. I did not put a lot of money on it last year. Um, the last leg was actually when Wisconsin beat Purdue with Jaden Ivey on the team on a buzzer beater three. Oh, uh, it was a three dollar bet for plus eighteen thousand seven legs, including a soccer goal by a player geez. that didn't start the game. He came in the sixty fifth minute and scored. Ah, ah <laughs> God! How much did you? How much did you walk away? So it was, it was a. It was three fourteen for five sixty one. Hey, that's money, man. That's fun. That's yeah. awesome, bro. Good lord. I gotta. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try though, man. Like I've been. You know, I've been trying my best to get like good because every show I got to do a good same game parlay and get it yep. in there. But like, it just it just never feels good. It doesn't I don't get to enjoy the game as much as I can. But gosh, people that hit like that, then more power. If only, if only it was 33, 31 instead of three thirty one. I put down. I would have been like, yes, <laughs> let's go car, baby. Um, And then uh, Kaz, last thing. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate this so, so much. Um, I want to oh. compare the Knicks roster to uh, the WWE. Let's Are you right? The Royal Rumble just happened, as we all know. Uh, Cody Rhodes won. Uh, what's her name? Rhea Ripley won. And then, but the biggest storyline of the night, obviously, was Sami Zayn finally helping out his friend Kevin Owens, El Generico, and Kevin Steen against Roman Reigns in the Bloodline. And as we would all imagine, Roman Reigns laid the hammer down. Yeah. I wanted so when I was supposed to do this pod with you last week, I actually had these questions set up prior to the turn, so <laughs> I kind of left them. Um, okay, okay. If it changes the answers a little bit or like changes the way you could answer the question, I mean, so be it. <laughs> I got you. I got you. This will be fun. Let's let's get into it. Let's get into okay. it. Okay, so let's we're gonna compare Nick's the Knicks roster to the Bloodline. Woo. First, the first question: Who do you consider more of the wise man secret council? Who's the Paul Heyman? Is it Tom Thibodeau or Leon Rose? I would say, I'd almost say it's Scott Perry, right? Like, I mean, Scott Perry is the guy who is, uh, who's, who stood, who's lasted multiple regimes, sort of like Paul Heyman, you know, like he's survived the ECW regime. He survived the ruthless aggression regime. He yep. survived the PG regime. And now he's here. Um, Scott Perry is the guy who just, who's, who might be the wise old sage out of everybody over there. Leon Rose, like, he has a little bit more mystery to him. You don't really hear from him a lot, but you hear a little bit more from Scott Perry. He's a little bit more front-facing. He's the one who's got to go out there and really cut the promos for the Knicks, you know what I'm saying? So That's true. And take the blunt of the – he's the person that media can actually yell at because he's he's the the first person you all see. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I think Scott Perry's more and more Paul Heyman than, uh, than anyone else. And then I feel like this answer might be Mitch, but who is the enforcer on the Knicks, a.k.a. the Solo Sokoa? Ooh, okay. So I look at it differently. I look at it like who's like young, up and coming, might be a, a future head of the table, but is currently a uh, uh, an enforcer. And I guess, yeah, I guess it might be Mitchell Robinson. You know what I mean? Like you forget how young he is because he didn't really go to college. He came fresh out of high school, really took a year off. Yeah, And um, I think now sort of like Solo Sokoa, once there's separation from the rest of the group, you're kind of just seeing more of his value. You know what I'm saying? And Solo, uh, I think, is has an immense, immense upside. And Mitch Robinson, to Knicks fans, 
have like been salivating at the upside for Mitch Robinson for years, right? Like if Mitch Robinson goes through the legs in a game, Nick's Twitter's like, oh God. If this man up. ever makes a three, I'm pretty sure MSG is going to collapse <laughs> right there. <laughs> Indeed. Like he's, Mitch has, has such a unique uh, body and a unique um, ability. He kind of reminds you of Solo, right? Like Solo yeah. is unique in the same way, whereas the only time I've seen anybody like him is uh, Umaga, his uncle. You know what I mean? So it's like even doing the Samoan spike and, you know, just being, just doing a lot of his moveset and the running splashes. And he's like a more cut and shape version of his uncle too. He's like faster yeah. and stuff. Yeah, man. I, I like, I like that comparison, man. So yeah, I think Mitch will be solo. <laughs> okay. So for the next three guys, right. Because I was going to ask this prior to the turn, which would have made these way less, way more friendly in asking. Right. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, st- I'm going to end with whoever Sammy is last. Okay, um, gotcha, but gotcha. well, so we'll go easiest to hardest. Um, who's Jimmy Uso on the Knicks? Who's Roman's right hand man? I am going to ask you at the very end who is Roman Reigns. So think of who that answer is first, and then who is that guy's right hand man, Jimmy Uso, through thick and thin right now. I think Jimmy Uso is R.J. Barrett, right? Like R.J. and Julius Randall have kind of been attached at the hip since he was drafted here and uh, Julius signed here. Yep. You know, um, they've been through great seasons. They've been through bad seasons. Uh, they've both been growing together. And, um, you know, main event Jey Uso, like, even though he's a great complimentary player, he's kind of shown you in glimpses that he could be a main event guy. He could be the dude that headlines the marquee that night. And RJ yep. Barrett's kind of been the same, you know, like he, on, on certain nights, RJ looks like the Maple Mamba, you know what I'm saying? Like, and and other nights, which is no slight at all. There's definitely more, uh, a longer career trajectory of doing this. But sometimes like RJ Barrett could be more of like a Sean Marion type where he's just a little bit of a do-everything dude. And yeah. Jay Uso is kind of like the same dude. Like utility person could be funny, could be serious, has shown you his real acting chops lately, can put on a great tag team match, a great main event match. And could connect with you emotionally as well. Um, RJ Barrett, I think, just due to the relationship that he has with Julius, and I'm assuming that's who I'm alluding to, uh, who is the current head of the table. Right. Uh, uh, I think I think RJ fits more like a Jey Uso. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, I see that. I actually, so I was looking for Jimmy Uso, like who's the guy's right-hand man through thick and thin, and then I was going to ask, Who's Jey Uso, as in who might actually stand up to Roman Reigns every once in a while when wrongdoing happens? Mm-hmm. And then, like, what, like, who stands up to Roman Reigns of the Knicks, and how would that even show, or how do they show that? Uh, gosh, who stands up to Roman Reigns? Of the who Knicks? stands up to Julius Randle? <laughs> <laughs> I guess in that, in- that instance, it would be Jalen Brunson right now, right? Nah, I almost think Jalen Brunson is not I like mean, stand up, but like calm him a little bit. Like he's the steady hand. He's the steady. Okay, all right. I'll put it like this. I don't. I wouldn't say who calms Roman Reigns down. I would say who gives him better direction. Right? Okay. The bloodline uh, up until Sammy joined was very one dimensional, and Sammy joining the bloodline. Give that gave Roman, gave Jimmy and Jay multiple dimensions to their character. Um, I'd say Jalen Brunson is more of a Sami Zayn in that regard because when Jalen Brunson came to the Knicks, he kind of unlocked Julius Randle, uh, especially after the season he had last year. And some people may argue once Sammy joined the bloodline. He kind of unlocked Roman Reigns. He was yeah. getting real, real baby face cheers every time the bloodline would come in and he would drop the city name and tell him, acknowledge me. Like that used to be full of booze before Sammy. But now yeah. when Sammy got there, you know what I'm saying? He kind of steered the ship right back into the correct direction. And Jalen Brunson has been steering the ship for the Knicks all season long, uh, not just when it comes to his play, but the play of their most talented player, which is Julius Randle. And when he's going, he's as good as anybody in the NBA. And a lot of that is due to Jalen Brunson. When Roman's going, he's as good as anybody that has ever done it in WWE. Absolutely. And a lot of that is due to Sami Zayn. So then the last question, because you already answered who Roman Reigns is by saying it's Julius Randle. 
Uh, <laughs> this might actually be able to tie into together the fact that this we're about to hit the trade deadline. Uh, okay. We're going to do on this podcast a big trade deadline show next week. Okay. But to tie that into this, who on the Knicks is the most likely person to be to slam the chair on the back and then be kicked out of the bloodline? Who's going away on the trade deadline, Kaz? <laughs> oh, gosh. Is it Ev? It might have to be Ev, right? Like, it's either Ev. We all would hope so, right? That would be the least painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, I think Ev, I think Evan is – uh, it's kind of weird, though, because, like, I don't think – Jalen's not going to slam Julius, you know what I'm saying? But oh, no. <laughs> I do think as far as trade deadlines are concerned, Evan will have to play the role of Sami Zayn here. Um, a lot of teams are looking for shooting help. Um, and I think Evan Fournier, uh, for the money he makes, um, is probably that's probably the only thing holding teams back uh, from yep. going after him because for everything that he isn't, Evan Fournier is a lethal shooter in the NBA, and in certain instances, he's carried this Knicks teams to victories. You know what I yep. mean? So, um, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, if he's moved with the pick to get some wing help, you know what I'm saying, to help better complement this New York Knicks team. Uh, so I think the chair goes to Evan Fournier, man. Like, I think he's swinging it. I think he's probably the most likely to be moved uh, this trade deadline. I think Emmanuel quickly has played himself out of the trade talks. I think he's kind of – 100%. You know, he's he's looking like a core player for the Knicks right now. Quentin Grimes, I think once he starts hitting consistently outside like he used to, I mean, it looks so pretty coming out of his hands every single time. It always looks like it's going to go in. But I feel like that's sort of like the last piece of this puzzle right now. Like, he's a yeah. great – of the rim he's a pretty good defender um he's a lot better playmaker than he gets credit for as far as like getting his other team involved Once it's amazing this coach- man has never finished a lefty layup in an nba game though it's a <laughs> phenomenal he always <laughs> goes righty no matter what <laughs> it's insane uh but no i think once he starts hitting his threes again he's gonna be seen as a valuable piece but you know obviously the cam reddish talk has been out there and i think we know he's gonna be uh probably packaged somewhere else soon yeah um, but you know, it, it it wouldn't shock me if if Obi Toppin is is in some of these talks as well. You know, um, I think there's no secret how much New York loves Obi and how much Obi loves New York. But I think you know a lot of teams see his value, and I think if I'm a, if I'm a team out there who's been watching the New York Knicks and need some stretch for help, like I would absolutely call about Obi Toppin. You know, like absolutely I think he can help a lot of. NBA teams. I don't want to lose him because I know he could have probably help this team. But you know, he's just the, the the timing just isn't. It's just unfortunate. You know, he was drafted in the same year as a Julius Randle career year, and yeah. Julius Randle's always going to have that leeway at that position because of what he's done in the past and short of what he's been showing this season as well. You know, so it wouldn't shock me if Obi's in those talks, but I would hate to see him go because I love Obi Top and I think he lights up the garden every single night. He's a fan favorite. But if I'm a team in the NBA, then I need a guy who's explosive that could shoot from the outside that has a ton of upside and potential. I'd definitely be calling the Knicks about him. And that if you need to actually make a run, even this year, he has like almost no mileage on him. He's going to be one of the yeah. freshest guys the second half of the year. If you get him for sure, for sure. He's only needed the, the playing time. Every time he's gotten it, most times he's gotten it, he's shown that he can be a contributor in the NBA. However level you see it as a as a rotation player, starter, superstar, like you've yep. seen it in every single way. But in any case, man, like I would definitely call about Obi if I was another NBA team. 100%. I would, uh, and I would still call about Cam. I mean, there's no reason to do with that much potential. That wingspan and that age is not, is Cam, not even Cam. trying I'm, to play. I'm, I'm Cam fan, but, you know, just, you know, sometimes it just doesn't click with certain coaches. And we've seen it with yeah. several players in the league, man. And, you know, you watch this. I don't know if you watched the John Wall interview with uh, Theo Pinson or whatever. Like, you, sometimes it just doesn't click and you got to go somewhere yeah. else. You got a fresh start. And I think Cam is very much in need of a fresh start. I think he's very much in need of a team that will em- embrace Cam and just let him do him. You know 100%. So just so we can get a proper idea of how good he is. But in Cam's in that defense as well, Cam's got to stay healthy, man. Like before he gets Cam, it hurt at inopportune times for sure. He gets hurt at the most inopportune times. It feels like every single time Cam Reddish had a good game or looked like a, a, a real player in this league or whatever, he'd be gone for two or three weeks. And then yeah. you got to work him back in. And then it's hard to work a, a player back in that's going to need that 
a lot the amount of playing time. So it's it's a tough place to be if you're Cam Reddish, man. He's just he's got to stay healthy, man. That's the biggest thing with him. Got to stay healthy. Agreed. Kaz, this has been fantastic. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. You have hey. 35 things to plug. If you want to plug any of them, all of them feel free. <laughs> man, just just go next, bro. Like it's 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 we've been through a lot this past decade. We've got two competitive teams in the last three years. Okay, can we can we be happy about that? Uh, we've just, won one playoff series in a decade. We're due for a second one sooner or later. We're due. We're due. <laughs> now, nah, um, catch me on Say Less with Kaz, Loki, and Rosie every Monday on my YouTube page, YouTube.com/slash Kazima. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can catch me on Count It on Points Bets YouTube, all their social channels. Uh, as well as their podcast stream every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. You can catch me on MSG Networks, hosting the BetCast, hosting Inside the Lines with FanDuel, Mike Janella, and Jeff Eisenman. You can catch me on the Mass Man Show, on the Ringer uh, um, podcast network as far as part of the Ringer Wrestling uh, Sports Network. You can catch me on the Ultimate Show. Catch me on This Is Awesome. And I think... That is all of my plugs, sir. <laughs> I'm going to post this, and then you're going to get call, a call from your agent like tomorrow and be like, dude, how'd you forget this one? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. There'll be something new by the time you call. This goes up, so we'll see how that goes. Oh, my God. For uh, for counting specifically, dude, you are right. That The prop queen, she hits like 70% of the time, and you guys oh, do great work. She is a beast, man. Like She put me on so much game. She is so talented, so funny, so insightful does a ton 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 of research ariel epstein is an absolute beast man she's a star in this industry and you know the the world's gonna know uh, if the world i mean shoot if you're into any sports game well you know who she is already but i mean exactly more of the world are gonna know just how good she is as the time comes man she's an absolute beast Ariel, I want to thank you. You've won me a lot of money and you've won anyone that's ever listened to you. Unless they catch you on literally one bad day a week, you've won them a lot. So much appreciated. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Kaz. Again, make sure to like, share, and subscribe uh, to the Big Nick Energy Podcast, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods, Podbean. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Join our Facebook group and join our chalkboard. It's a messaging board app designed specifically around gambling and sports. Our page is at 77 members, I believe. Once we get to 103, it's 100 minus the three of us that run this. We'll be doing a Knicks ticket giveaway. Uh, yeah. Let's go Knicks. And let's.